Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I kind of, you know, been thinking about, um, you know, well, I, I was going to say a couple of verses, but I, I'm always, you know, like, uh, I think I'm like in this place where like, I could literally just think about one particular verse and, like, just think about it. Not for a minute, not for a day, like, days and weeks. And <clears throat> and <clears throat> it just becomes, you know, I don't know, life, I guess, for me. And... It literally feeds the spirit, you know, the inner man, um, and and the desire to see the spirit uh, grow greatly in our lives to produce the very fruit. You know, every I know we can go to the Book of Galatians and we can say, "Oh, this is the fruit of the spirit," you know, and list the nine and, you know, and we've categorized and we've done all those wonderful godly forms. But the true fruit of the Spirit is pictured in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the fruit. It's the fruit of the womb. It's the fruit of... God's doing and His choosing. And when God decided to create a habitation uh, in His creation, He could have chosen anything. But He decided to choose, you know, Adam. Adam. You know, we can... You know, people can debate and they can argue, you know, whether man is 6,000 years old or 6 billion years old or, you know, whatever. Like, who cares, really? Most people who argue over points are just trying to prove they are right. Because that's Adam, the fallen man. His only desire is to produce self exaltation. This is why, when you get to the book of Isaiah in chapter 14 and it talks about Lucifer, it is not talking about Satan or the devil. It was talking about the one who lifted himself up in the garden. And that was Adam. Though Eve is the one who was having the conversation with the serpent, she was still Adam. She came from Adam. But that was God's habitation. That is what he chose. That is what he desired to live in. He has no other desire to live in anything else. Now, I could say this. He wants to live in his creation, but he wants to live in it through a redeemed man, a new creation man, one who no longer has his own life. He doesn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Is this okay to do or is this not? Literally, if we ask those questions all the time, it really shows a lack of maturity in our relationship with the Lord himself. When what God is after is a people who are just like him. 
He created man what? In his image, after his likeness. No other form. And so in reality, if you can really accept this, if you've been born again, literally born again, you've become a new creation. If any man or any person is in Christ, they're a what? New creation. So now you're not a human being. You're a spirit being. And you still live in an earthen vessel. But he has a solution for that too. Right? Just like he knew Adam was going to fall, he had a solution already prepared. That's why the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Victory was secure. Humans were redeemed successfully. Yep. Yeah. Like, literally, if you can understand this, that God's habitation is the human framework. The heart or the mind, the mind, will, and emotions, the soul realm, must be governed by the Spirit. And it can't be like Adam before he fell with potential possibilities of failure. No, it has to be like Jesus with no possibility of failing. Two different entities. Suke, Zoe. Now you and I didn't have a choice. We did not. But then he gave us one to choose. But in order for that life to be fully manifested, God must test his seed. No, he has to. You know, I was reading, you know, like, like, Right or wrong, I just do this. If I'm thinking about buying something or doing something a certain way, I only look at one stars. Because I want to see what, how crazy people are. Like, don't read, you know, you read what people, like, it's amazing the world even revolves when you listen to some of the stuff that comes out of people's mouths. But, um, like, but somebody said something that I really can identify with because I say it all the time is, like, we don't build anything, you know, we don't build anything to last anymore. You know, wash machine, five years go to the junkyard, right? We don't care. I've said this for many years. Most people have a full, if they, if they hang on to their stuff, they'll have a closet full of clothes that are probably barely worn, and because of, you know, social behavior, you always have to have something new. It's not God's way. It never has been. Because it's not about satisfying the soul. It's about expressing God's spirit. And so when we see in the garden, Adam and Eve... They had to have a tempter or a tester. Had to. And we saw what happened. And so then Jesus, in Matthew 4, I'll use, I like that description. Jesus, he went to the wilderness, led by the Spirit of God, to be tested or tempted by the tester. And the reason is, is because he wants the wash machine to last forever. Like, if we don't think this is true, then explain to me somebody, please tell me why does Isaiah prophesy the lamb and the wolf will lay down together? 
that the lion and the ox will both eat grass. Because God has determined a change. I love to say this all the time, regardless of how ugly it looks at times. And that depends on how much news you watch or whatever. But listen, seriously, wrong will not triumph forever. How do you know that? God loves righteousness. He hates iniquity. He hates iniquity in you and I. He hates godly forms or forms of godliness. He doesn't like it. Well, he's merciful and he's gracious, yeah, but it doesn't change us if we don't let it. So God has a tester. You know, I love Genesis 3.15. Where, you know, it says Satan will do what? Bruise the heel, right? But the seed will do what? Bruise the head or crush the head. Whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter. And it's so cool what that really means. Now, we all know that Jesus, you know, like, like I... You know, this, this is just me. Like, I, I listen, I, like I said, I, I not listen. I, I read verses, you know, and, and they just, like, I have a verse, like, out of John chapter 14 that just is like, geez, I want to be like that. No, that's, that's my goal. But not just for me. For all of God's people. I walked through the grocery store today, like, God, these are your people. They just don't know it. You put yourself in them. Now, modern church people have assessed they have an automatic in. The only way they have an automatic in is those that he's enlightened wake up. And don't let the tempter fool you. I mentioned something on Sunday about Tobiah. Remember what Tobiah, anybody remember his name? Like, what is he picture? Like, okay, we could say the devil, we could say, we could say Adam, we could say just the wicked person, right? We, but the thing that was interesting was his name was religious. But I believe that his nationality, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, go look it up and if I'm wrong, but his heart was Assyrian. It was like Ishmael. His father was Abraham, but his heart was Egyptian. Yeah. Hebrews 4 verse 1 says, Let us fear. We have a lot of religious people today that will run around saying, oh, you shouldn't be afraid of anything. And that's because we've had bumper stickers for years that says no fear. And so psychologically, we've deadened the spirit of what God is after. The fear of the Lord. Let us fear. You know what my biggest fear is? that we'd come short, miss out. Now, I am confident that who who started something will finish it. I just want to make sure that we're a part of it. I guarantee. Do you remember, what, remember this? Do you remember this? Oh, God, this is good. Do you remember this? Do you remember when David numbered the people? And even... Even Joab, you know, like Joab was like, you know, Joab, he was, he was good. He was a good soldier and everything, but you found out he wasn't really on David's side. He hooked up with the other son of David instead of Solomon, remember? I do like how he died, though. I really do. I think about it all the time. 
I'm not coming out of the temple. I'm staying here at the altar. You'll have to kill me here. Hey, king. He says he's not coming out. He says, all right, kill him. I just want the sword of the Spirit, his word, to slay me at the altar so that the only thing that is living is Christ. Yeah. But David numbered the people. And Joab said, don't do it. It's wrong. And Joab went out and did what David told him to, except for he did not number Benjamin. Oh, hallelujah. He did not. And then because David numbered the people, what happened? 70,000 people were killed because of David. I can hear modern Christians, well, that ain't fair. But do you know why they all got killed? Does anybody? What? What did you say, Corey? Oh, I thought, you, I thought you, you had an answer. Do you know why they got killed back? No. They all had the same problem David had. The only reason David, only reason David numbered the people, arrogance. And Satan slipped in. Tobiah had a place right in the temple when Nehemiah showed up. Oh, the devil's defeated. He is. The truth of the matter is, Jesus bruised his head. And what it really means is this, like when, it's, when it talks about Satan being cast out, you know, cast out, and you know, we get into all this crazy stuff, you know what it really means? Now you should jump, and j jump for joy on this. He was overthrown. All of his kingdoms became God's kingdoms. Every single one. But everybody can say this with me. But we still have a problem. No one to come up short. Turn with me to John 14. I'm just going to read my verse. I don't have any order to look through all this stuff. But I have some verses I want to share. And I hope, you know, like, you know something? I really do believe this. This is an area in the Bible, in the New Testament, even though really the book of John, most of it, it was the Old Testament. <laughs> uh we don't want to hear. But who wants to buy something or have something that can't stand the test of time? I think Jonathan is a wonderful picture of a great warrior, even living in the midst of his father's house. But when push came to shove, he couldn't go in the wilderness with David. And speaking of David's arrogance, do you know what David did? I guarantee you 100%. Like, I was there. I can believe it. <laughs> no, seriously. I guarantee you if you would have asked David before he had an affair with Bathsheba, he'd have told you, no way, I never will. Guaranteed 100%. How do you know? He numbered the people. What's the first thing that God hates? Pride. He gives grace to the who. But what does he resist? Who does the devil like, if I can say it like that? Where does he work? He works through the carnal mind. Pride and arrogancy and all those things. John chapter 14. Uh, what do we want to read here? Where do we want to read? Verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. I give um, unto you. Uh, uh, <laughs> give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away. Right? And I'll come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice. 
Because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. You know, this doesn't work in our lives if we don't love Jesus with all of our heart. It doesn't. And he was testing them at that very minute. Hmm. Now, when Jesus went to the wilderness to be tested of the devil, you know what? He could have had everything we have and been in control of it. Who do you think is in control of the federal government? The local government. The government in your house. And we don't go by what we say. It's fruit. Now every family has trouble. It's just the way it is. But repentance is a very awesome avenue for God's people. How do you know? Saul never repented. David always was. And just in case you think David didn't get over his thing with Bathsheba at the end of his life, God tested him again, and he never touched the virgin. Yeah. He could have. Oh, he's an old man. Don't kid yourself. By the way, he was only 70 years old. Can you imagine that? Like, when I read the Bible, I think David's like 150. No, 70 years old. Not very old. I mean, when you think about Jacob was, what, 130-some years old, and he said, I haven't lived long as the rest of the fathers have. Which, by the way, was well past the 120-year mark that everybody says, I wish I could live to 120 years. That's the promise. Never was. Never was. Never was. I grew up that way. That's what I heard all my life. I'm like, wait a minute. Abraham lived longer than that. So did Isaac. Even longer. We missed something. And now I have told you before, and it come to pass, that when... It has come to pass, you might believe. That you might believe. Now here's my verse, verse 30. And I absolutely love this verse. And you may not get anything out of it. Because the thing that will give you something out of it comes from the Holy Ghost. I just sit in my own little world and say, make it real in my life. Not just for me only, but all those that want to stand in the gap for God to finish what he started. It's impossible to my naturalness. I can't even comprehend it. We live in a world, our world, a Christian world, where most people are offended over nothing. Can you imagine? I'm going to kill you. Well, you have a choice. Stand there or run to Egypt. Like, can you imagine? I have come to a place in my life, I don't care if people like me or not. That is weird. It really is. But he was made of no reputation. Nobody liked him. Hosanna! Crucify him. The fellowship of his sufferings. How many want to reign with him? What's the scripture say? Not in just one place. 
you're going to have to what? Suffer with him. Now, I know, don't get me wrong. I watched the R-rated movie of the Passion. He took a beating. But I believe that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, not my will, thy will be done, it was the greatest suffering of his own will. His own desire. Here's my verse. Oh, hallelujah. Hereafter, I'm not going to be talking to you very much. The only thing they really knew what was on the outside. He explained to them over and over and over, I have to go, I have to die in order for you to know me in a whole new way. When Jesus rose from the dead and Mary Magdalene saw him and thought it was the gardener and he said her name and she heard his voice because she didn't recognize him. And he said, don't touch me. Don't touch me. And I've heard messages my whole life, my whole life. that he said, don't touch her. Or he, he told her not to touch him because he hadn't ascended to the Father and that... She would pollute him. Do you realize that there's not a thing you and I could do that could pollute him? Not one thing. I mean, really, what could you do? He is incorruptible and immortal. How am I going to get out to that boat? There's a hurricane going on. Yeah, let's go for a stroll. The only thing they knew was on the outside. Hereafter, I won't talk to you much. I, I, I will not talk much with you for, this is where I wanted to get. This is the part of the verse. For the prince of this world cometh. And hath nothing in me. The Living Bible says, I don't have much more time to talk to you, for the evil prince of this world approaches. He has no power over me. None. Zero. No power. You know, when I was growing up, and I, was, I went to Grace Emanuel at the time, and it was in the... 70s, it, I mean, we started in the 60s, but I think it was in the 70s when this happened. I, I can't remember, you know, but um, I was just a, you know, just a, a youngster in those days, and our pastor Sexton at the time, Brother Sexton we called him, you know what he used to tell us all the time? Because, because the, the, the great thing of the television world was Flip Wilson and the devil made me do it. And he literally used to tell us all the time, the devil can't make you do anything. Can't make you do anything. Can't make you do anything. He has no power over me. My dad always used to say that the devil is just a dog on God's leash. I guess I've rephrased it. He's the tester for all of humanity. Now, you and I, as humans, or Adams, old men thinking, old man thinking, we'd say, well, why does God do that or allow that? Never understanding that if you don't, like, like, I don't do this. I've built two showers, and that's the final, that they always test drain them before they button everything up. I never do. What if it leaks? I'll have a problem. <laughs> Nobody wants a shower that leaks, right? So what do you do? 
to test it. Test it. Test it. Our bodies, whether we like it or not, have appetites. And I don't just mean for food. When he says that the belly is the God or the God of the belly or whatever it is, I forget exactly the way he says it. I don't, I'll have to go look at it so I'll know. But he wasn't necessarily talking about, he wasn't talking about food. He was talking about desires. Desires. Desires drive us. When I was a kid, this was pre-internet. Only, probably only Sherry and I can remember this. Do you remember when the Sears catalog and the, Montre, uh, the uh, Montgomery Ward catalog would come? And like, it was like being on your iPad. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you had to write everything down and either call on the phone and order it, or you could send it in the mail. And yeah, yeah. So really, you know, all we did was just speed things up. We've increased technology like, I don't know, in the last 125 years, you know, I used to say 100, now it's 125, maybe it's even getting closer to like maybe 150, but things have really sped up. And 150 years isn't much in Adam's timeline. It's not much. But the human sanctuary... Need some improvement. Cleaning. The tester is at his way. Turn with me to, let's see, where do we want to go? Let's go to, I think it's First Peter. First Peter, chapter 5. I'm just going to read these verses. I have one little thing I want to read, and then we'll just go home. Don't you want to come to a place that the prince of this world has nothing in you? Like nothing. Like seriously, people, like I, I'm telling you, every single person in this room, at some point or some things that are said by me, like they just don't. And I'm not. I'm not throwing stones or anything. I'm just saying we just like. But the truth of the matter is, we'll come short of what He has predetermined in our lives. I have a question. If, if you think I'm crazy, just like, like when you get really religious, people get really religious. Go outside of this room and you'll find lots of religious people, right? Maybe you find them here. I don't know. But listen, look, did Jesus defeat the devil? Did he conquer the grave? Does it still exist? Two laws parallel walking side by side. All we have to do is choose. I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't, I, I, I really don't know what to say. All I can say is this, listen, seriously. The prince of this world whew, has nothing in us. That's what I want. Amen. Then we'll never have to worry about anything Because you truly won't be your own. Okay, verse 8. Did I say 1 Peter 5? Verse 8. Here we go. Be sober. In other words, be careful. Watch out, right? Be sober. Be vigilant. Because, why? Why, why, is, he te- why is Peter saying this? Now look, at Peter is the guy that Jesus said what? Get thee behind me, Satan. 
And when Peter, James, and John went up into the Mount of Transfiguration with them, John and James, being brothers, said, look, he's bringing Satan with us. <laughs> no, okay, you guys are... Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, not Jesus's, he already bruised the head or he already overthrew him. Thrown out. I'm telling you, David did not think he'd ever have a... You know, I, I just... My brain pops when I think about not only, not only did he have an affair with her, he set up the husband's murder. Now, don't go read the Bible and say, God's, God told him, okay, David, because you did all this, you're going to have trouble in your own house. And he did. Absalom was a mess. The other brother was a mess. This is what happens in a house. And though it may not, you know, like we can send our kids to college, they can get good jobs, have all the, all the stuff, money, and the whole works. But spiritually speaking, let us fear. Lest we come short of being its fruit. Fruit that remains. Spirit. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So he has a job. No, he does. An assignment. Now, you know when it says it bruises the heel? It bruised the heel, right? He bruises the heel. The heel. The only thing I can collect from that, me personally, like I've literally wondered this for years, what does that stinking mean? The heel, the backside, the past, the old man. It's the only thing he can bruise. He cannot affect the new creation man. Because there is nothing in the new creation man from the prince of this world. He can only affect the old man. If we get offended, old man characteristics. Irritated? Frustrated, mad, angry, all the above and below. Oh man, it's the only place Satan can bruise the heel of the seed. What you're walking away from. Backside. I think it says in Romans, I didn't go look it up. I just am going to quote based on memory. And you'll put your feet on the head of Satan, serpent. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Let's, let's go quick. Uh, second, second Corinthians um, Chapter 2, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 10. I'm going to read fast. Go. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Now, that's a whole lot of old English, just which means 
If I forgive, if you forgive someone, I forgive someone, forgive, 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 right? All in the name or the nature of Christ. This is the problem when the woman caught in adultery, right? He forgave her. Not a loophole. Bruising the serpent's head, overthrowing him. Now here's the next verse. Less or unless, in other words, so we're not exploited, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. He's sneaky. For we are not ignorant of his devices. You know he's sneaky. You know that he lives in the carnal mind. You don't need to be taught that. You know that he attacks the flesh, the old man. You know his devices. And yet... We still have issues. All right? Are you good? Uh, wait a second. I think I might have missed something in this chapter. Uh, no, it didn't. I don't think. I, I don't know. I don't know what I... Oh, no. Here we go. Second Corinthians chapter 11. I knew I was... I, had, I knew that was on my radar. I'm almost done. I think. I hope you're getting something out of this. Like, seriously, like, I just do this. Like, I just, like, the prince of this world cometh and he has nothing in me. Like, we're Pentecostal. Cast that devil out. No, 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 he never did that. He never did that. That's a modern phenomenon, probably from the 1800s. Scream louder. It'll come out faster. No, they came to him and said, what are you going to do with us? Because he had already overthrown the kingdom. Verse 3, chapter 11, verse 3, 2 Corinthians, here we go. And, he, and the interesting thing about this chapter here is the problem with the Corinthian church was they had more religious activity going on, convincing one another how great they were, always boasting. And so then he says this in verse 3, but I fear, lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm frightened, fearing that in some way you will be led away from your pure and simple devotion to our Lord Jesus, just as Eve was deceived by Satan in the garden. The snake. Clever lies. All right? Ephesians, I'm almost done. Seriously, I seriously am. Chapter 4. I, I've actually, I think I've mentioned this, maybe not in church, but I know I've mentioned it outside of church several times, several different places. And I just think that God is, you know, like, seriously, for me... We need to sharpen our discernment. We usually find out the real issues when they're already blossoming. Verse 26. Be ye angry. Oh, hallelujah, we can be angry. And sin not. 
let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Does anybody know why? If you let it sit there, you'll become bitter. And bitterness is sneaky. It'll hide itself. Neither give place to the devil. In other words, don't give him a foothold. This is what the TPT says. Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. <laughs> All right. I just want to read this. I rarely ever read commentaries. But for whatever reason, I decided to read it on this. Just in one little section. And this is what the person said, which I think is from like the 1800s somewhere, 1700s. Neither give place to the devil. This has, and this, this will, it's a little awkward because it's Old English. This has respect probably to the exhortation in the former verse. Do not yield to the suggestions and the temptations of Satan. You're all right. Take care of yourself. Think about yourself. <coughs> who would take every opportunity, because he goes about it as a what? <coughs> Excuse me. As a roaring lion to do what? Kill the seed. He's a seed killer. <coughs> Strain in my voice who would take every opportunity to persuade you to cherish unkind and angry feelings and to keep up a spirit of resentment amongst God's people, the brethren. This is why people change churches like fish going from one pond to another. Yeah. Many of our feelings, when we suppose we are merely defending our rights and securing what is our own, are produced by the temptations of the devil. The heart is deceitful and seldom more deceitful in any case than when a person is attempting to vindicate themselves from injuries done to their person and reputation. Jesus never had to turn the other cheek. My God in heaven, help me. Never. There was no retaliation in him because there was no reputation. You don't like me? Sorry. Think you're better than me? Okay. Jesus didn't care. Why? Why didn't he care? Because he knew who he was. He wasn't running around. I'm a kid's king. I'm a son of God. I'm a this. He didn't even call himself a Christian. He just plain and simple knew who he was, and he acted like it. You know who hates this kind of message? Our flesh. I got Jesus. I can overcome all this. Okay. I'm just letting you know he's testing his product. He did at the beginning of the era, in the middle of the era, and why not at the end of the era? He can't have a counterfeit or something, some broken down jalopy. 
There's, this isn't a resto modification. This is a new creation, man. Where Jesus is the head of a body Amen. that cannot be altered. New creation. The devil is always busy when we are angry. And in some way, if possible, will lead us into sin. And the best way to avoid his wiles is to curb our tempers. Like he's just doing this. This is because of these two verses in the commentary, right? And restrain even sudden anger. No man sins by restraining his anger, and no one is certain that he will not who indulges it for a moment. Let us fear, lest we come short of not being able to say, the prince of this world cometh, and he has nothing in me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I just thank you, Father, for everything you're doing in our lives. God, you are protecting your merchandise so it will last forever. Trials and tribulations, you said we'd have them. Temptations, you said we'd have them. But you also said we overcome the world by our faith. So God, tonight, continue to help us. We don't want to be babies forever, God. Grow up, mature. The true work of God is to express you. In Jesus' name, amen.